Morning everyone, in this video we're going to talk about opportunity costs and resource management. MCP has a great deal of resources you can manage and I've listed a couple on the other one and we'll talk specifically about how you might manage them. And then opportunity costs has to do with, you know, the thought process that there are things in this game that are good and then they come at a cost um, that you have to kind of decide whether it's worth it to you or not. So we go to the next slide and then just here's just a little topics we're going to talk about. So, I mean, the easy, I mean, character slots like team tactics cards, that's like an easy one for an opportunity cost, right? Having a character in your slot is at the cost of not having someone in your slot. So when you're limited to like 10 or five or whatever you're limited to, because even team tactics would be who you choose, um, you know, you have to think about the cost of having certain characters in your list. And I think one thing that kind of you kind of get better with when you iterate with lists and, you know, myself included, is, you know, you have characters in there and then you play some games. And then once you're probably, you know, a good bit of games in, you can, just, you know, am I using this character? You know, is this slot wasted? Um, are situations, am I just not getting the right situations? Is it rare enough that, you know, maybe I just don't keep this character in? Am I missing something else? Um, so that, that's more like squad building. I mean, that's not too much of a resource thing. I, I kind of threw it in there just because I, I did want to make a point on team tactics cards. <coughs> Excuse me. Something I read a lot on the discords and stuff like, and it kind of blends into leadership as well a little bit, but like the baseline, like you shouldn't be thinking of the baseline of a tactics card as nothing. You should think of the baseline as a tactics card of what is this? representing what else could it be right so there's cards out there that people are like they make comment on it and they're like this is cool or this seems good and you're like oh blah blah blah. and then not even the the power that you have to pay like oh it's two power for two dice or whatever in some comparison in that way but it's like what could that card be and does it get you something better um that's, that's probably the big one with Team Tactics cards. I think a lot of the cards have good abilities. So I'll give you an example. Um, Magic's Jim Limbo through um, Journey Through Limbo card. Moves somebody three, gives them incinerate, could be friendly, could be enemy. It's like three power. It is not a bad card. In fact, when I read them like this is, all right, I could see, I could see in a world where you have this card on the table and you have Magic, that it would, yeah, it, it could, you could do some really good plays with it. And, I, and I'm, I'm not going to claim it's a bad card, even in this example. But I can also make the easy claim that, like, okay, if Magic's in your 10, how often are you playing her? Are you playing her enough to where it really is worth having that 10th card that only she can play? And even then, is it really, like, worth one of your 10 card, one of your 5 cards when, you know, there's Sacrifice, there's Brace, there's... Iron Mount Books, there's all these other cards, Eyes on the Prize, like how often is it even making it to your 10 um, or to your 5, if that. And then you got to think about, you know, sure, at the end of the day, if she has 3 power, you can think of this perfect play where she teleports Hulk away and he's out of the game. But I mean, Strange can do that too for 4 power. I mean, it's not her, but you, you know what I mean? Like things like that where you really, and that's why Eyes on the Prize is like a, such a feels bad card sometimes to play. Um, I understand why it's good, you know, you'll heal the, you and I know why it's good, and I do take it sometimes, it depends, but sometimes it just sucks, because it's not just like, if you're doing it with Bill, you're moving up, you're moving back, and now you're kind of out of position, at least if you do it with Strange, it still feels really bad sometimes, unless you're like double hammer grabbing, um, <coughs> um, still feels weird, because you're paying a card for it. You're paying a card. Like, team tactics cards are really good, like, to the point of... I, I made a pr thought process one day of, what would a team tactics card slot be worth? Right? And, and what I mean by that is, let's just say that you had a really good 17 list, 17 threat list, and, some, and you're playing 18. You're like, man, I really don't want to upgrade a 3 to a 4. I really like this 3 here. You know, is a team tactics card worth one threat? Like... Could there be a system where if you for every threat you play down, you get another team tactics card? 
right? Like, I don't know. Like, that could be a thing where it's like, there's times where I think Wong is better than a three, but I need to fill it with an affiliated three. And I could say to myself, well, I would really love another tactics card and I'll play Wong instead. I'll just play somebody down. So that's one that has, doesn't need to be answered because it's not in the game, but it's something to ask yourself. Like, sometimes you're like, man, do I really want to... Like, a, a good example of um, the eyes thing is, like, eyes on the D-map, where there's, like, a scrawl or a, a, something on a hammer on the outside Ds, where you're like, do I really want to pick it up and walk away? Like, because not only am I walking away, paying a card for it, there's really no extract you can get to there's no, like, thing to sit on. Like, normally, like, if you sure, if you're walking up, grabbing a hammer, walking back to a back B or F, sure, you're doing two for one. You're basically picking up and securing something. But you're, it's the opposite with a hammer on a D-map. You're, you're essentially picking up a hammer. You can't walk to anything. And you're undoing the secure that you want to sit on, right? So there's a thought process there that, like, is it worth in that case? So that's, you know, the opportunity to have other cards in there. Opportunity to have other characters. Um, I think leadership is another one too, where it gets talked about a lot. Where people, you know, Steve Three is probably the best example of it right now. You 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 focus on the leadership, and you say, "Wow, he really turns people up to a ten, some of them eleven, whatever you want to call it." And he does. There's some characters that stick out that are Gamora, Luke Cage are really good with his leadership, and. Kind of the thought process you need to go to when it comes to this is not just like it's easy in a vacuum to look at Steve Three's leadership and say this mathematically is very good on Gamora. And she may not be the best example because it is very good on her. But then you got to say, all right, the other thing is, how am I going to pay power? Is it actually going to come up? But also, like, you're not like leadership are not zero versus leadership. There are other leaderships in the game. And you could say to yourself, well, yeah, this I mean, like every leadership in a sense, especially like the the Steve Rogers, both Steve Rogers, you know, things that affect attack. Like every all leaderships do different things, but like there's an opportunity cost of of that. Like it, it shouldn't be, yeah, you know, Steve Three's leadership really you get more consistent triggers. Steve One's leadership you get cheaper superpowers, can do more stuff early. Sam's gives you good stuff versus attrition because you get uh, reactive movement you know if we're just talking about avengers like those are where you're comparing like what you get for having all three versus each other not zero versus one type stuff on top of that i do think the model it comes on really needs to be considered in some of the package um some of the potatoes that you know like do you get enough out of it um you know is the model good uh, there's a lot of things to consider with like leaderships like that. Like, do you want to be playing this model? Because you're basically paying the threat of the leader for the leadership. And again, it's not like you got to go with Sam having his leadership versus Steve Three having his leadership. Compare the leadership, say, ooh, which one do I want to play? And then compare the models and say, ooh, do I want to play four threat for this leader and have this guy or three threat and have this? I'm not, and I'm not making a claim of which one's better right now. It's more of this idea that on these leaderships that like change how characters work, especially the two Steves, you have to think about what are you giving up in terms of what opportunity of other leaderships could you have had and what model they're attached to. That's, that's what I'm saying. And I think it's not thought of a lot. Um, we're getting into resource management. Deployment. So this is kind of like an opportunity cost thing that I don't, I, it's kind of more of a deployment specific. I, the first couple I put in here are really not the greatest examples of stuff, but I wanted to kind of brush on them. I think one thing people don't do in deployment enough is give them a chance to do plays even if they're not going to do them, but to threaten a play. Because as much as it seems like in this game, turn zero, turn one are scripted and stuff like that, um, it is scripted to a sense of like, what you actually position yourself to be able to do and how your opponent reacts to it. So an example would be if you start, you know, and this is why deployment order matters a lot, especially depending on what pieces you're thinking of. Things that matter a lot are people that can touch the midline, people that can safe grab, people that can get to back Bs and C, Fs 
like medium moving uh, medium bases, for example. Like, where can people get to? Because I'll I'll give you a very very super basic example. Let's say you're playing Paranoia, and there's four in the middle. And let's just say you say, well, I'm not really gonna be able to grab that offside middle one, and so you don't put anybody over there. Like, not even, like, somebody in front of it or something. Well, you basically said to the opponent, you can grab that and I can't even touch you. Like, I, maybe you have no one to threaten that, that one. In that, like, you're basically giving them that paranoia for free in a sense, if they want to go over there. I mean, it's not perfect. But let's say you put Logan in front of it or some model in front of it. Maybe you threaten their order of activations. Maybe you threaten that, like, hey, I'm going to attack you if you go get it. Or you threaten, hey, if you, if you don't put anything over here, I'm going to go pick it up and get it for free. Maybe it's a two threat, like a widow or something. Um, I think giving yourself as many opportunities in the early turn to do different things and react to your opponent, because I, I think there's a little... Because um, I think you can ruin their script in a sense. And I think plays like that um, are actually very good in this game. Because... Like, turn one, especially if it's, like, a lot of secures or, or like, the secures are in the middle of the board, like, uh, what's the damn one called? Intrusions. Like, if you just do something like, if you, I'll give you an example. You're playing Intrusions Cubes, and you just double walk um, Lizard and take their back cube, right? Depending on the characters in front of it, they might not have a great ability to go after lizard enough to like daze him or at least to the point where you like can get to the middle so if lizard takes your back cube and then everybody on the enemy team walks to the middle and all of a sudden you're pouring attacks into lizard and let's say it takes three attacks to daze him and none of your guys have moved off the board or off the back edge or they've only moved once then and so okay so you get your cube back lizard dazes and all the enemies on the middle of the board and now was that worth it was that worth the, you know, the resource management, the resource being your, your movement actions? And so I think if you set yourself up for that deployment and then give your opportunity and can, because it can change with time, right? Like if, if let's say you don't want to steal their back B because I don't know, they have some model sitting there to attack you and that model activates and they go steal the midline or go steal their other B and then their strong model activates and doesn't pick up the cube and walks somewhere else. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can still get to their cube because I put my guy in position. And the model who I was worried about killing me is gone. You know, if they have three models that are really good hitters and they all have to hit you, maybe you steal it the second activation if they don't pick it up. And you have to do this from the other side as well. Like you have to think about this stuff on your, you know, and that's where the activation order really matters for resource management is, you know, what can I afford to do? A good example from one of my cuts games was I was playing Burb. I was playing this, the same Avengers. And if you look in how the game went out, like on one side had Rhino and Voodoo looking at a scroll, like facing off against my Rhino. And it was like a game of chicken of like who wanted to go out there first and get the scroll and be threatened by the other Rhino. But on the other side of the board, he did all his activations. It was an F map of scoundrels. And I realized that when, like by ter- third activation, I was like, all right, everybody on this side of the board is gone. Everybody's gone. There, no one can thread my guy who walks across the board. So I teleported Strange and walked to his back F and attack Sam. I knew I had priority, but even being on the back F, I didn't have last deployment. It was like the third activation of my turn. I just did it because there was no downside at that point. No one could get this to Strange to attack him now sure and voodoo and rhino were on that side of the board luke maybe could have done something to like reactively get into a good position for the next turn (coughs) but because he activated in that order and i'm not saying it was a bad order but because he activated in that order i knew what was over there and i could go make that play where if he holds like maybe if he holds sam or he holds bill or something we couldn't because he safe grabbed but then I wouldn't be able to do it so early. Um, so anyway, that's the whole deployment. There's opportunity out there to do things. So you, you'll get better about that. Let's talk about resource management a bit. I think this is, I mean, this is a big topic. And I, I find it so fascinating um, 
because this isn't like the first game with resource management. I think Malifaux had a lot of resource management. A lot of that was like activation management and action management. And MCP has a different variety of it. So just for a little contrast, you know, I've mentioned this before in other videos. In Malifaux, you had much more varied activation numbers. Like you were talking like 7 to 15, depending on if you summoned a lot or something. So there's some bullshit stuff. And you couldn't pass back then in in the, in the second edition. So I would run lists that just like had tons of guys, like tons of cheap guys, and then a couple good ones. And I would just do bullshit stuff first and make them go, make them go, make them go, and then I'd do all my good stuff at the end. And I don't think that works as well. That doesn't really work as well in MCP. Um, a big reason because you can't like lock down people. And what I mean by that is. In Malifaux, one, you had more guys. They're, like Having like eight, two threats is not going to do it for you here. But I'll give you an example. In Malifaux, if you had a Hulk and a Widow, you could walk Widow next to Hulk, and Hulk like was limited in what he could do because Widow was standing next to him. That's like This is the analogy that doesn't actually work in MCP. Like, Hulk would either have to attack Widow or have to make a roll to get away from her. He couldn't just like walk away or leap away. Um, because there was like uh, engagement rules, so so that's more of um, yeah, that's just something that's not here. I like that. I was very good at doing that particularly, um, but that's like uh, you know, I would limit their actions because they'd have to attack me and then they couldn't walk away, and so their actions just kill the two threat. And you're like, okay, cool. In this game, you don't have that. You don't have that same like you can influence it in other ways. Um. And I think that's a big thing that maybe people don't do enough. But, you know, it's a different resource management here. Um, power is the biggest one. And I think power goes two ways, obviously. There is a rubber banding effect that we've talked about in MCP where when you get, do power to somebody, they power up. And so you have to be really careful with who you're giving power to and when. Um, but at the same time, you get power when you get attacked, right? You're on the opposite side of that. And so there's times where I feel like people... I think people are too scared to be attacked sometimes. And maybe it comes from... And there's a lot of variables here. Because of the day's mechanic and priority and all this stuff, like, you, you might not be able to take advantage of this power. So when I think of power... The couple, I mean, it's like the base of everything, right? It's really hard to like talk about this a little bit. But when you come to power like resource management, I think you're managing your power and you're managing the enemy power. So what you're doing, um, you have to think about, is it worth it? You know, is it worth the power? What do you need next turn? This is like basic stuff like, oh, if I was on the prize with Bill and I don't have a power leadership, I'm not going to be able to throw the next turn or knowing the enemy can't throw the next turn. Um, I think this also affects what you do as a player. Like, if you see somebody that has, like, a place or a leap or something, um, and you're going to throw them away, and let's say they're one power short. Let's say it's Ulick, and he has... He's going to have two power at the beginning of his turn. Let's say it's zero, because he can generate two. You could say, all right, I'm going to throw you into the space because you can't do your leap. Where if he already has leap up, you might be more willing to throw him into an enemy or throw him into a building just to be like, all right, you're going to have the power anyway to leap. I don't care if you have one more. Because our breakpoints on characters were like, I really don't care if you have one more power. A good example is Rhino, where he can only spend six power a turn without team tactics cards because he can only you know, throw terrain and stampede. So if he's at six and you want to just try to kill him or, or will him down, you, you might as well go to, to ten. Like, who cares? Um, and then that goes into a topic that's interesting that I haven't really fully fleshed out is this idea of <coughs> how good are people with power? How good are certain models with a lot of power? Right? I think there is a scale where you could say this character with 10 power is can do so much shit that it's like scary. And then there's other characters where you're like, oh, if they have 10 power, like, who cares? Right? Doc Ock is kind of an example. The new Doc Ock. I think he has a good leadership. I think he's going to be seen a lot more. 
But you look in one. I was reading a Discord. One one thing about him is he only has two ways to spend power: his throw and his spender. His spender is underwhelming for the cost. Let's just be clear. It's it's like seven dice that gives conditions on damage. Okay, for four. But he has nothing else to. I mean, that's probably like a three cost spender in reality. But he has nothing else to spend his power on. So it's like other than his throw. So it's kind of like whatever. I'm sure you can spend power doing flipping points and stuff like that. Sure, I'm not going full like he's useless with power. But there are people that are better with ten power than others, and I think it's something to think about as a resource because no matter what you're doing, damage you're giving people power in some capacity, barring some certain abilities, and if you give them to the weaker people with power then you're not giving them as much as a resource. Now, of course, there's health involved. There's what are they going to doing? Are they holding an extract? There's a lot of options there. But it's something to consider. Uh, maybe, maybe said differently, there's times where you need to chip models down because you're not going to be able to one-shot them and you just accept I'm going to chip them down for later. And then there's models that you're like, I need to kill this model now. And I think the ones that you, you want to like blast through are the ones that can really spend power well. And I think there's ones you can chip down because you're like, eh, I really don't care if you have two or three more power. Like, you're not that much stronger. Sure, you're going to... Everybody has strengths and stuff, right? Like, it's not like no one can use their power. But are you really, like, super threatened by a Widow with ten power? Probably not. Like, sure, her spender's pretty good if she can get in range and gets the one attack. Gets the stagger off. I mean, yeah. But it's not like she has much else on her card to spend her power on other than, like, Counter-Strike shit. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, who cares if Widow has 10 power? Now, how she's going to get 10 power, realistically, is another thing. Um, but yeah, man. Giving power to people is a really big thing. It's a really interesting dynamic. But it's also you're getting power, too. And I think that's where gainers versus builders and having models that can utilize power well also matters. For example... Doctor Strange and Ultron. Two models I use a lot. Doctor Strange in particular. Well, Ultron too. But Doctor Strange in particular. He can do a lot with his power. Mainly it's just teleporting people. But it's a... I mean, teleporting three is almost a stagger. Placing three is like almost a stagger on some people. If not worse. <coughs> so... When he does damage... He's not only removing health and getting people low and potentially dazing them... He's get, and he's giving them power. He's also getting power to do other things. That and you think about the opportunity or the you know is re, is Strange's power worth more than somebody else's power? Maybe, right? It could be, and you have to think about that. And sometimes it is. Sometimes you're like, I really just want to attack this person. And I don't care if they get power because I'm going to get power. And if I get power, I get to teleport them away, which negates their power. And so I think there are models that are really good with power, and the better you are with power, and if you have, like, builders instead of gainers, the more you can get out of just attacking people and saying, I don't care if I give you power, I'm going to be stronger because I have the power. Um, yeah, power is just an interesting one. Really got to be able to see the game and be like, what can they do? Um, you know, thinking about models who have activated versus not, I think, you know, a lot of these are going to blend together because... Um, they all, like, affect each other in a sense. So, you know, health and, like, dazing people, you know, that's a resource because you do want to daze people for the most part. You do want to eventually kill them unless you want to play non-contact MCP. But for the most part, I think... I think a mix of, like, aggressive scoring control... I don't, I don't like this, like, black and white control versus aggressive or uh, attrition mindset i think it i think they all blend together i think you can do both and i think there are times where you know picking off an activation is really good right it can be really strong and i think more control air quote teams should do damage i i really do think they don't do enough damage sometimes and they try to rely on like double walking everywhere and walking away and eventually they get closed in on and they die and they don't have enough people to win the game um, so, uh, you know, 
And then there's like killing people who have not gone versus killing people who have gone. It's an interesting thing because you don't want to, if you have priority, maybe you don't want to burn it, right? I didn't even put it here, priority. Managing priority is a big one. If you have it, maybe you don't kill the person before you activate, before they activate because you want to keep priority. But maybe they kill somebody of yours and now you know, oh, you killed somebody of mine. I know that if I kill somebody of yours, I'm going to keep priority. And it really matters sometimes, depending if you have like really strong models who can then like top a turn, really affect the game, whether it's play, moving people or killing them. Um, and and it, it's kind of interesting because <coughs> this is where having less mo- I mean, listen, I, I think having more models is definitely fine. There's some scenarios where you just need them. But if you're playing one down, it's interesting because you're going to have priority most time. But if you if you're 6 versus 5 and you start your turn and kill somebody, you still have priority because now it's 5, you know, now you have 5 and they only have 5, but you're activating one currently. So you can keep priority by dazing people too. And that's something to like understand because you know, in an example one of my games, I, I daze Sam at the top of my turn, but I knew I had priority and I just kill him at the next in the top of my next turn. Nothing you could do unless you you somehow protected them. So I think stuff like that, some teams can do it better than others, obviously. But like understanding that, you know, um, the activation order is big. Like sometimes you hold an activation. Uh, you know, here's, a, here's an easy one, like a, maybe a Wong or something. Sometimes you might just want to do him to kind of pass. Right, I'm going to do Wong's activation because I don't want to influence. I want to see what you're going to do with the with my other maybe more impactful models. Um, and so it's essentially a pass, especially if none of your models are in a place to like really get steamrolled, and especially more so because um, you getting attacked gives you power. So there's always this dynamic of like, man, I really would like to kill this guy or attack this guy. And sometimes chipping down models is great, but then you're like, man, if I can't get him in one go, he's going to have power to do his steal or something, like a Miles, for example. Miles sitting on two power, maybe far away, and you're like, shit, if I attack him, he's going to get his steal up for free. If I don't kill him, if I kill him, it's going to be priority to him unless he kills one of my guys. There's all things like that. But Wong is a good example, just in this case, where you say, all right, maybe I do a passing activation. But maybe... The passing activation, maybe if you held Wong, maybe they're targeting Wong for some reason. Whatever reason, they might be targeting killing Wong. If you go with him, then they can kill him without affecting priority. And who knows what the order is. And maybe they don't, you don't want that. Um, like maybe if you hold him, in a sense, it, it, let's say they have priority. And they might want to target Wong. The longer you hold his activation as best you can, the more that they can't kill him without giving you priority, potentially, depending on what's happening on the board. And that's just something to think about. Because the minute you go with them, and the minute they die, they could die on him like they wanted to do, but now you've spent his activation, and they're going to still get priority. Sure, there, there's developments out there. Maybe they, maybe they take out Wong to give you priority because they want last activation. Right? There's just so much to think about in terms of who you um, activate and in what order. And one thing about the health being a resource is health is is a resource in two ways. I think people aren't willing to get hit enough, especially if you if you know you can be safe enough. Like, let's just take like super dice spikes aside. Like, you can kind of rely and be like, oh, I'm probably not going to die in just the one hit, depending on what you're taking, of course. But I really want them to hit me because I'm going to get power. And if they hit me, I'm going to be able to do something else. And if, if, it, if you're saying, you know, there's a lot of claims out there that, oh, the enemy's not going to hit you and build power, so this person's power starved. Well, then put yourself in a position that if they don't hit you, you're going to impact the game, like, heavily, right? Like, this is the kind of the thing of maybe some of this really super control style. Where it's like, we never touch each other, we just walk around and firewall people or something, right? If you put your people in positions to like, be like, hey, hit me or I'm going to hit you back, right? 
hurt me or I'm going to score this point. Like, then they have to make a decision. If you sit back and do nothing, it's, it's super easy to be like, I'm just going to steal your shit and walk around, rotate, and win. If you go in there and say, hey, I'm here, and if you double walk to this point, I am going to attack you and eventually kill you. And, and that's the thing, too. Like, as you do damage to people, like, you might not be getting a point that turn. You might have to sacrifice one point to double attack somebody. But then later on, when they're dead... They're not scoring, and you can easily catch up, potentially. It, it all depends on scenarios. But there's times where just killing people will make it so hard for them. We're just keeping it close. We'll just make it so hard for them later on in the game because you're doing the damage. And actually, that's an interesting one because <coughs> there are times where... And I don't even put this on here, but I just thought of this example. So here, clearly, I have forsaken this PowerPoint list, and I'm just talking. Um, pick an example where you're sitting on you you have an F open and they're in the middle F with one character and you have the last activation this is a maybe extreme example you could go sit on your back F for free and you both get a point or you can go contest the middle one and neither you get a point you really need to think about the score of the game and how you think the game's going to go out because if your plan is to maybe go down a point or two early and then catch back up, you definitely probably want to go contest the middle one. Because even though, in theory, it's the same outcome, right? Let's just say 3 to 4 versus 2 to 3. The difference, you're down by 1. The difference is they're farther away from scoring out. And so there's a lot of games, quote-unquote, there's a decent amount of games where like it comes down to like a turn 3 or 4 swing, where you just do so much killing that they just can't finish it, and all of a sudden it's like 12 to 14 for them, but they have two models left, and you're just going to win. I mean, that's a bad example, but... So I think there's times where actually tying the score, tying points, instead of just taking the one-on-one one is better. And this is why I think that some of these styles where, like, you do kill models and maybe sacrifice a point here or there... Um, or to get into position is is good because eventually if they can't score out in like three turns and just end the game, and as long as you're keeping it close, I mean, don't go down 0-6 or some shit like that. But, you know, go make them do stuff. Go make them attack you in some point. You know, if you need this, if this model really needs power to get going and you just sit on a back F, then you deserve not getting attacked. You walk to the fucking middle or walk to their F and say, hey, I'm here. I'm here. Do something about it. Right? Make them make decisions. People don't like that stuff. I think people are really... I think, I think you'll find that people are very good at turn zero and one stuff at the top level. And they are less impressive than you'd think at like decision making after that. And this is not a knock on people I've played. And this is, but this is like that's where I think the game really begins. And I think where you see more people's weaknesses. I think people are really good at their setup and their turn one and their crisis bullshit and their scenario stuff. But I think when you really start messing with them, and it almost looks like bad play. But I think when you really start fucking with people and being like, "Hey, this is this is you're not going to steal this one extract and walk to the back of the board and win." I'm going to come across the board and maybe go down a point or two and then fucking kill you. And it looks like you got lucky because you walked over there and killed them and stole their points. And in reality, they just, they, they tried to play safe from turn one and you're like, nah, not going to happen. You're going to waste so much time walking and I'm going to attack. And that's why actions themselves, you know, you, you can boil down a lot, some of this game to just how many actions are you taking? And what are you going to do with those actions? Where are they going to go? Where are you going to walk to? You know, and and being like, you only get so many actions with people. Make them worth it, you know. Put yourself in a position that you can start attacking and doing stuff. You know, there there's some stuff turn one where, like, getting just up the board on, like, intrusions. And I know it's scary, but just walking on the intrusion and saying, hey, come meet me on the intrusion. Like, some people like to do, like, a weird, like, you almost like bait and attack turn one. Where you're like, I'm on the intrusion, and they have one activation left, and you're like, all right, what are you going to You're either going to attack me, <coughs> excuse me, and possibly not make it to the intrusion, or you're going to just double walk there, and then me, me double walking there didn't matter. 
And then I have priority, so I get to attack you first. Um, I think not being over this year. I think health is a resource that people don't use enough. There's times I don't brace early on, even though it seems like I should. Um, because maybe it's size three on somebody good. I'm just like, fuck it, I want the power. Give me the power. Because if I brace it now, I'm going to lose a power. And then my guy's garbage next turn because I have no power anyway. Um, so fuck it, let's go. Let's just give me the power and then hopefully I'm going to activate and do something before he dazes. And, and do more than what you did. Um, so health is definitely a resource. And I think probably the thing I'm getting better at now, and I was pretty shitty at when I was playing like Logan, X-23, like aggressive uh, Sam was putting people, like, I think you can kill, like, there's decision points of if somebody activates, you can kill them. Depending on how they spend power, depending on where they are, it might be a good idea because maybe you have priority and you can just kill them before they go, or they have priority and they're not that scary and you kind of want them to d activate first. You're almost forcing them to activate first. Um, or you just do, like, Four damage. And they have one left. And you just leave them there. And you say, alright, I'm done attacking you. You've activated. You can't go. You got some power. You have one health left. I'm almost forcing you to activate that character first, in a way. Or I'm just going to kill him straight up, next turn. And you'll lose the activation for, like, a big swing turn. And so there's turns sometimes where you see, like, a bunch of people on, like, one or two health. And depending on what the enemy team is, depending if you're aggressive and can attack enough, you just straight up like, like you go, you start, you start your turn, and you like kill two models, and maybe teleport another one away or something, depending on who you are. And I think, and then you just do a massive swing turn, and if it's late enough in the game, right, it could be so bad that they can't recover from it. It's just you're scoring too fast, or you're scoring out that turn. That could be another thing too. You're just, you just daze everybody at the right time. Like you spend two turns keeping it close and keeping people low, and then boom, on turn three, you just daze a bunch of people. You get their extracts, you get on the secures, you score like seven to one, and then you win the game. And so I think, I think keeping people on one um, can be really big too, so you can make big swing turns. Sometimes you just kill them, and you're like, why did I kill them? Um, uh, let's say the game is ending the next turn. This is a, this is a good example that's happened to me. Miles activated. I do this really cool thing where I like throw people into each other, do this damage, and I daze both of them. Whatever. And I'm like, why did I daze this other model? It had one health left. I know let next turn's going to be the last turn because we're both so high on points. Or maybe it goes to a tie and from there, but let's just say it doesn't. Why didn't I just leave him on one and kill him at the top of the next turn? Right? Because now I've, I've killed him. I'm sure he's, he's injured, but he wasn't scoring anyway. It also depends on what they're scoring, too. This is, this is where positional awareness matters a lot. Um, if somebody's not scoring, like, a lot of times it's, it's okay just to not kill him. Maybe do some damage. Maybe put him out of place. But just be like, all right, stay there. You're not, you're not, I'm not getting a point. And if I kill you and the game, you know, it, it, I guess you need to think about Dazing somebody, depending on, you know, sometimes it scores you points because they have an extract. Sometimes it scores you a point because they're on a secure. Um, sometimes it takes away an activation if they've already haven't gone yet, which can be really big. Those are like opportunity cost to killing somebody and, and usually a pretty good one. If they are not scoring and they are not, if they're not scoring, Unless you think that the game plan revolves around taking them out the full the other way, it's probably best you don't kill them. That's, that's, that's what I mean is, like, sure, if you date somebody round one and it's three to three, like, yeah, go kill them and then you're up a model and that's great. But unless you think you're going to wipe them out on both sides, sometimes holding when they die is really important. And sometimes you gotta let people die and to do other things and you know, sometimes getting a character to get bopped around and beat up and then you wake up with a bunch of power and just do a million damage and they can't finish you off and you're like, alright, cool. I wanted all that power. So, 
that's a lot of resources to manage and when to do it and a lot of decisions to make. I'll talk about board space real quick. Board space is just, it's probably the the frontier that is the least utilized in this game, partly because there is, like, I was talking about the Malifaux example, there is no, like, engaging somebody which messes with them. Like, let's just make up a rule for um, MZP. Let's just say if you're engaged with somebody, we'll say within one just for the sake of this, if you're within one of an enemy, you can't use anything longer than range three. You're just clouded by being in the fight. You just can't use range four or five. So it would be much more interesting to have like little models run in and like fuck up turrets or something. Like people who just sit there instead of being like, I run Widow next to your big turret and you can just shoot five at somebody else anyway. It's not a rule. It's not built in. Not complaining about it. Just an example. That's where board space will matter a little more. Um, I do think one of the most un utilize things and I, people do it i mean i'm not saying it's no one does this but i think the like a frontier that people could get better at myself included for sure is using the board space to really mess with opponent's plays whether it's blocking throws with rock because he can't take hits from it whether it's putting yourself in a perk position where you can't really be dragged anywhere or thrown into your friends um Maybe attacking into some angle where they can't bump effectively to get out of your second attack. I think that's a big one against Convo, for example. Um, or I think Ultron drones probably make me think about this the most because they can't, like, you kind of want them to die sometimes. And so I guess what I'm trying to say there is they are, you can really think about where you're putting them to annoy somebody. Because a lot of times people don't want to kill them because it gives them power and power and stuff and it hurts them. And it, so really like you can put there and say, where does this base like annoy them? I'll give you an example with Ultron, potentially. I'm not saying it's a good example, but um Ultron, I believe, I believe his drones can walk on a middle um Oh, I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody has ASM in the middle of the board and they want to pick one of the two paranoias to safe grab. And you go first and you have Ultron. I'm pretty sure you can walk Ultron to pick up one of the points and then walk the drones on the other point in a way that ASM can't safe grab the point in one action. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Like he can't get to it in one action, in one move. Right? Maybe he can walk up, attack your drones, kill them, get power, web swing in, pick it up, but he can't get out safely. Maybe somebody else comes in and kills your drones first. Maybe you then walk up and grab it with somebody else. But that's a space thing. Like, there's place, and it's not that easy. So you're like, I, I thought about it like Eyes on the Prize shit, where like, if, if you went and grabbed one, like two hammers, you grabbed one, I mean, people do it with Nick Fury where they grab both with the grunts and I don't like doing that, but it's similar to like the idea of putting your model in a space that fucks with somebody like, like putting a rhino on a secure in the front of it to where it's really hard to walk around him to contest it. Right. Stuff like that. So I think there's stuff with board space and blocking throws and blocking other things that can really mess with people and like really just like, these moves were like a double move in a straight line gets them there. But you put a model like right where their first walk would be to where they have to go around you. Um, I think has a lot of, uh, could potentially do something. So uh, thinking about board space because it impacts the rest and it's like a, a resource of like where you're, where you're at. Also board space for just like, um, I don't know. There's just a lot of things to manage in this game and think about when you're making each attack. Do I want the power? Do I want to give power? Is this a good use of my action? Should I walk here? Am I scoring it? Do I have priority? Do I want to give up priority? Do I want to put this person low because I want to kill them at the top of the next turn? Maybe I want to keep them alive for longer. Do I hold this activation because I want them to possibly attack me, give me power to do something else? But if I know that they won't attack me, then 
I can hold it forever and maybe it, you know, as the activations change, right? As you're forced to do things, the game changes. So you can look at the game state in the beginning of the turn and also like things like this. Making the board, like setting up the board to where they need to do something. And they have three things they want to do as their first thing and they're in bad positions. If you make it easy on somebody by saying you have one model that's low, it's in a great, you know, it has to go and I have nothing else threatened. Um, then it's easy. They're going to, if they have already, they're going to do that first. And maybe that's good or bad or not for you. But maybe you set it up in a way of like, all right, you know, maybe, maybe this other model of mine is threatened a little bit, maybe a little bit threatened. But if you go after them first, I'm going to get this model over here that I already hurt. But if you go with the hurt model, I'm going to go with the model that now is in position to threaten you. Right? I think there's, I think there's room where you could do it both ways, where you can, people just want to always be just out of, just out of three or just out of this, where if they were just in, then they had the opportunity to say, hey, listen, if you don't go, I'm going first and I'm going to attack you and do some stuff here. I think that's maybe a little bit more dependent on, like, maybe I have that view because of um, bump and why I think bump is so strong. Because bump, you can essentially do that. You can say, I'm going to start within three. We're both range three. I'm going to start within three. If I get to go, I'm going to attack you. If you go first, you're going to hit me once. I'm going to bump back, potentially. And you're going to waste your second action. And then maybe I'm in a position to still do stuff. And I got power. Like, like there's a lot of things to think about. I don't think it's as black as white as some people make it to be. I think the mid-game stuff, I mean, just watch... Just watch the streams of the top eight games or the top 16, the top cuts game. Screw the first two turns sometimes. Just look at what's going on turns three, four, and two probably. And look at what actual decisions are making and think about whether you think it's right or wrong. I do think a lot of, it's funny, the comments on some of the games are like, you know, great game, clean game, only saw this one mistake. And I'm watching, I'm just like, man, I think there was a lot of mistakes. And I think some the good players know that. I mean, I'll call out Curtis real quick. He had a tough loss. To Thanos, and I and I watching the game. I think I think Curtis did play better and had to play way better than the Thanos player had to play. The Thanos player didn't do anything great. Special, special is probably the better word. He was fine. It's a good player. He just and you could say that Curtis got diced because it, he there's like one or two two or three dice rolls that if the Thanos guy just doesn't whiffs it, it's over. But the, Curtis will tell you like he could have made plays where he ran away the other way or or he forgot an aggressive move to win him the game and so it wasn't perfect it wasn't just the dice rolls there was a lot of little decisions he could have made he could have not ran bill here he could have ran this way um you know and that's and that's you know there's a commentary to be like hey if you have an extra character that you think you're they're gonna hunt down <coughs> maybe you put him in a way that's like they can't get to him later on like like where your model dies or is injured also inhibits the enemy for next turn, right? Like, if you just run Toad to the side and say, all right, you're going to get him if you want, but you're going to be away from the rest of the action, and I'll just accept this point straight, and, you know, I'll win because I have more threat on the other side. Like, just using the Curtis versus Dim Lord game, like, Rhino essentially led Thanos into the rest of Curtis's team. To kind of kill them and win the game. He basically led all the viruses to one location. To where they could be combined and he could lose. If Rhino for example. And I know Rhino did stuff. I, this isn't the best example. Because I think the way the game flowed. He, it was fine doing this move. Or like the Bill. If Bill just would have walked away from Thanos who had two. And just said listen you're never going to combine these. Curtis probably would have won. Because like he was so close to winning that. As long as those things don't happen. As long as they don't combine each other, like, you're good to go. Instead, he brought Bill next to Thanos and got him punched in the face. Um, anyway, that was a pretty good talk. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks.